Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Jeannie Ahn. Dr. Ahn is a nephrology specialist with Washington Hospital. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about diabetes and how it impacts your kidneys. We'll start with what are kidneys. Your kidneys are organs. They're located in your upper back. Their primary job is to remove waste products and excess fluid. It removes certain drugs and toxins. It also makes hormones to help control blood pressure. Another hormone called erythropoietin that helps make red blood cells. An activated vitamin D um, hormone to keep your bones healthy and regulates minerals like sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. Chronic kidney disease is defined as the gradual, usually permanent loss of kidney function over time. And it's divided into five stages, with stage one being kidney function greater than 90%, but maybe with protein in the urine, and stage five being less than 15%, which is usually when people go on dialysis. So how does diabetes affect your kidneys? High glucose and high blood pressure can damage the filters in your kidneys. The earliest sign of this, of diabetic damage to your kidneys, is usually protein in the urine. When you have progressive damage, it leads to kidney failure. That means your kidneys are no longer strong enough to keep you healthy, and you need either a transplant or you need to go on dialysis. Diabetic kidneys uh, affects both kidneys, it just like it affects all systems in your body. And early kidney disease doesn't have symptoms. So who gets diabetic kidney disease? If you're a type 1 diabetic, about 30% of patients develop chronic kidney disease. 40% of those will go on to progress to kidney failure. In type 2 diabetes, which is the majority of people, 10 to 40% develop chronic kidney disease. And 10% of those will progress to kidney failure. Now that being said, because diabetes is so widespread, diabetes is still the number one cause of end-stage kidney disease in the U.S. So protein in the urine. Albumin is the main protein in the blood. Albumin generally stays in your blood. However, if there's damage to your filter, it will leak through into the urine, and this is called proteinuria, which is protein in the urine. This is a sign of chronic kidney disease. If you have a lot of protein in the urine, you can get swelling or foamy urine. Or if you have a little bit, you may not have any symptoms at all. So protein in the urine is treated with ACE, that's called antitensin converting enzyme inhibitors. It's a type of blood pressure medication. And ARB is also a type of blood pressure medication that helps to lower protein in the urine restricting dietary sodium and controlling your blood pressures. Those are all measures to help keep the protein in your urine under control. So how do you prevent chronic kidney disease if you have diabetes? These are the main interventions that we have. Control your blood pressure, control your gl blood glucose, use ACE inhibitors, which are the type of blood pressure medicine, medication that can help protect your kidneys against diabetic kidney disease. Avoid high protein diets. Make sure you have early screening. And then this presentation is also going to include some FAQ and some conclusion, uh, my conclusion. So first point, controlling your blood pressure. How many people here know what their blood pressure goal is supposed to be? Okay, maybe just me. Okay, <laughs> so your blood pressure goal, according to the American Diabetes Association guidelines, blood pressure goal should be less than 130 over 80. If your blood pressure is higher than 115 over 75, you're at increased risk of cardiac events and death in diabetics. If your blood pressure is greater than 120, systolic, this is the top number, this increases your risk of going on to kidney failure. 
So this is a graph that shows the correlation between blood pressure and kidney function. And you can see that as your blood pressure goes up, your kidney function goes down. And if you have untreated blood pressure or hypertension, which is the other name for high blood pressure, you'll have much worse kidney function than people who are able to maintain their blood pressure in a normal range. Reaching your blood pressure goals, we start with lifestyle changing, reducing your sodium intake. Some people are very sensitive to salt. Reducing your body weight, a 10% loss in body weight can result in an improvement in your blood pressure. Eat more fruits and vegetable, low fat dairy products, and avoiding excessive alcohol. So alcohol does raise your blood pressure and chronic alcohol use can contribute to high blood pressure. Medications. If your blood pressure is greater than 140 over 80, you may need more than just lifestyle changes to keep your blood pressure under control. You'll likely need some medications. I want you to keep in mind that the average number of blood pressure medications in the U.S. is 3.4. That means if you're on one or two medications, you may feel like it's a lot, but you're actually below the average that's generally needed to reach blood pressure goals. And then I would advise you to buy a blood pressure cuff. So just like you have a glucometer to monitor how your blood sugar is doing, if you have high blood pressure, you want to monitor how your blood pressure is doing because you won't know just by how you feel. So a few words about sodium. Sodium is a mineral that influences your fluid balance and your blood pressure. Your kidneys can remove up to 99% of the sodium that you, um, that you eat. Sodium is found naturally in foods, in processed foods, and sometimes added as preservatives. So the sodium recommendation for a patient with chronic kidney disease is 2,000 to 2,400 milligrams a day. A good way to keep track of this is to read food labels, because our food labels are all required to list the contents now. This is a list of high and low sodium foods from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Just want to point out that the, the FDA considers salt to be a high sodium food. That's interesting to me. Another thing that, it, that I wasn't aware, necessarily aware of is a regular tomato sauce. So tomato sauce is also listed on the list of high sodium foods. And on the other side are some low sodium alternatives. Okay, glucose control. This is probably a topic that you hear a lot about. Reducing your glucose reduces your risk of complications. So we're looking at what are called microvascular complications or complications that are resulting of damage to your small blood vessels. This include damage to your eyes, which is retinopathy, nephropathy, which is damage to your kidneys, and neuropathy, which is damage to the nerves, uh, to your nerves. So if you reduce your hemoglobin A1C by 2%, what this chart means is that you have a 60 to 70% reduction in these complications. This is another graph that shows that. You, the different colors are different co diabetic complications, and this is graphed against your A1C. So your goal is A1C less than 7, and the reason for that is that this uh, reduces your risk of having complications or side effects from diabetic disease. As your A1C goes up, so does your risk of complications. Okay, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. How do they help? So this is a, a one of the initial studies that was done in 1993, came out in New England Journal of Medicine. And what we looked at was the endpoint, death, dialysis, or transplant. And does it matter if you take an ACE inhibitor or not? And what it showed was that it did. It made a big difference. This is one of the few classes of medication that makes a difference in your mortality, not just in um, you know, midpoints like bl blood pressure or protein. It affects whether you go on to dialysis and whether you are more or less likely to die. So it is usually standard for diabetics to be on this type of medication unless they have a contraindication. Protein restriction, that's a question that we get a lot. Should I eat less protein? So you should definitely avoid excessive protein. The ADA guidelines for protein intake 
um, are for Americans to eat 0.8 to 1.0 grams per kilo of body weight and reduce it further to 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight if you have advanced chronic kidney disease. Usually, so, you know, the US RDA recommends one gram per kilo body weight protein intake. So this is not far from what the US RDA recommends. However, most Americans eat far in excess of the recommended amount of protein. One thing to consider is that if you have a lot of protein in the urine, decreasing your protein intake is not going to change the amount of protein you spill in your urine. There are um, two separate processes, the food that you eat that goes into your body and what leaks out of your kidneys. Protein needs. So your serving size would be about the size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. This is the serving size, and you should have two of these servings a day. So if you think about going to a restaurant and they give you a 40-ounce you know, steak, that is not a size of a deck of cards. That's a probably excessive portion of protein for anybody to eat, let alone somebody who has some chronic kidney disease. So these are some better things, fish, vegetables, it's hard to eat good food sometimes, I understand that. Early screening, so what is early screening? Measuring your serum creatinine. This is a blood test that's part of the most common lab that's ordered by physicians. It's part of the basic metabolic panel. The creatinine lets us know how your kidneys are doing. You should also have a urine test at least once a year for a urine albumin. This is screening for early diabetic involvement of your kidneys and monitoring of your blood pressure. Probably every time you go to see your doctor, they should monitor your blood pressure. So most people with chronic kidney disease are not aware of it. And that's because early chronic kidney disease doesn't have any symptoms. The symptoms that are listed on the slide here are symptoms for patients that are um, in the late stages. This is more like if you're in stage five. If you're in stage one through four, you, you are unlikely to have any symptoms to let you know that your kidneys are not doing well. This disease is one that's monitored by lab tests and not by asking people, how are you doing? Frequently asked question, should I drink cranberry juice? So the study where they looked at cranberry juice was actually evaluating urinary tract infections. And they looked at nursing home women where they gave cranberry juice or the two capsules of cranberry supplements. And what they found was that there was no change in the frequency of urinary tract infections. If I think people, there are other studies that show that it reduced the amount of bacteria in the urine, but it didn't, inf it didn't reduce infections. There's still a lot of things on the internet, though, that says that you should drink cranberry juice to prevent bladder infections. What I can say is that the data doesn't necessarily support that, and if you have an existing urinary tract infection, drinking cranberry juice is not going to treat it. You need to see a doctor and get an antibiotic. How much water should I drink? So the usual wisdom is eight, eight ounce cups a day. So the US water adequate intake recommendations are sort of based on observational studies. They just sort of looked at how people did in um, the uh, National Health and Nutri Nutrition Examination Studies that were done. And what they found was that women had intake of about 2.7 liters a day. Men had intake of about 3.7 liters a day. This is an observational study to say this is what the people drank. It was not, they didn't do any evaluation to see whether that was enough or too much. So it's not exactly clear how scientifically based recommendations for drinking water are. What I can tell you is that if you're older, you can't always rely on your thirst because as you age, your thirst mechanism becomes less active. Another question is, if I drink a lot of water, will that make my kidney function better? They actually did a study on this in uh, May of 2018 where they took a cohort of people 
316 people and they were coached to drink water and then there was a control group where they didn't coach them to drink water and they looked at their kidney functions before and after. And what they found was that there wasn't any difference in their kidney function, that the people who drank more water went to the bathroom more, but their kidney function didn't change. Did it hurt them? Probably didn't hurt them, but I think the point is that drinking water is not a maneuver that's going to treat your chronic kidney disease. Should I worry if my back hurts? So their back pain is very common. 75% of Americans will experience back pain at some point. This is the, uh, where your kidneys are located, are right below your last ribs in your upper back. They're not located down by your hips. They're kind of higher up. Most kidney, if your pain is related to your kidneys, then it's likely related to stones or infections. Here are the more common reasons why people have back pain. That they have disc disease, that they have um, arthritis of the spine, that they have narrowing of the spinal canal, that they have herniated or disc degeneration. The two highlighted ideolo ideologies or reasons, stones and infection, are one of a long list of causes for back pain. And I can, chronic kidney disease doesn't have <laughs> symptoms. So if you're having back pain, chances are it's something other than your kidneys. Prevention of chronic kidney disease and diabetes, these are likely things that you've heard before. Control your blood pressure, controlling your blood glucose, relates to your risk of developing complications like kidney disease. Use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs are recommended in patients with diabetics. Avoid high protein diet, make sure you have early screening, and manage your weight. What else can I do? So other things, Tylenol is okay. Opioid based medications don't harm your kidneys. If you have low kidney function, use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories these are blood i'm sorry these are pain medications like motrin ibuprofen advil aleve these can lower the blood flow to your kidneys and can affect your kidney function so you want to be careful with those you also want to keep your cholesterol and your ldl under control your cholesterol can cause hardening of the arteries that go to your kidneys just like it causes heart disease stop smoking, um, increase your activity. So recommendation is for 30 minutes of activity on most days. And you wanna be careful with contrast dye. So if you have a CT scan, if you have an angiogram, the contrast dye it can be hard on your kidneys and you wanna be aware that the people who are administering these tests are aware that you have impaired kidney function and can take precautions beforehand. If your kidney function is less than 30%, and you would know this by your lab tests. So on the lab tests, the EGFR, which is a lab result listed directly under your creatinine, correlates roughly to your percentage of function. So if your EGFR is less than 30, you should be followed by a specialist and not just a general practitioner. How do we treat chronic kidney disease? So if you find that you have chronic kidney disease, we uh, treat complications, we evaluate for comorbid conditions, and if all that doesn't stop the progression of the disease, then we prepare for timely initiation of dialysis or transplant. That's all I have today, thank you very much.